All right. So we're going to make our life a little bit more complicated today. So we talked about the universal law of gravitation, which was the force of gravity is equal to big G times little m times big M divided by R squared. But as you guys noticed the other day, if you have two objects that are just like in gravitational attraction to each other, then if that's the only thing that we talk about, these two objects will just smash into each other and then we're done. But we know that from the planets and the orbits that occur, there has to be, yeah, gravitational equilibrium is probably a good way to try to describe that. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, like, I mean, like, there, is, but there is some kind of equilibrium happening, right? So, like, the the Earth and the Moon do have this Newton's third law pair attraction to each other. So the Earth pulls on the Moon, and the Moon also pulls on the Earth. But yeah, and and the good news about that is that these um, the pulls as you get further and further away get weaker and weaker. So yeah, Jupiter does and, and Saturn does pull on the moon, but it's not nearly as much that would cause like issues or trouble or or anything like that. It's not gonna it's not going to mess up the orbit of the moon or the earth or anything like that. You would have to get a large planet or a large object to actually like disturb the gravitational orbit. And that's really what we need to try to talk about today is that the Earth and the Moon uh, don't crash into each other because the Moon is continuously falling around the Earth. So there is a pull that is happening here, but this pull is continuous and constant, and it's also in gravitational. Uh, it's it's the gravitational force is the centripetal force that's happening here. So if we look at the forces, yeah, there is a force that's pulling it in like this. And this uh, motion that goes around in the circle is centripetal. So we can actually get a couple of different things from this centripetal force. Um, we can get uh, information about the velocity of planets. We can get information about the um, time that it takes for things to move around in specific orbits. Um, but one of the things that we necessarily can't get uh, is information about the mass of the objects. And I'll try to show you why that is uh, the case uh, whenever we go into a little bit more detail. Well, um, well there, are, there are large masses. However, using, the, um, th using these equations, uh, the mass of this object actually doesn't really matter. So it doesn't matter if you had the moon out here or if you had just like a really small spaceship, uh, they would both orbit around at this place with the same speed. Uh, because if you went with a higher speed because of centripetal forces, uh, the orbital circle would get bigger. And if you went with a slower speed, the orbital circle, oh, hang on, I think I just said that backwards. Uh, I did say that, I did say that backwards. Yeah, if you go slower, the circle is gonna get larger because it's going to take it a longer time to go around. Uh, but if you get closer, the force gets greater, so you've got to move around faster to, to prevent yourself from falling. Yeah. Yeah, like whenever you guys did the lab, whenever you had the stopper spinning around uh, the top of your head, um, you had to, like whenever it was a small circle, it had to spin around really fast for that to happen, uh, at least in terms of RPMs. I think that was in, also in terms of linear velocity, too. So um, let's really kind of get into this Newton's law of gravitation as we see it from an object moving around in an orbit around. We're going to have to make one big assumption, though. Okay, so with this assumption, um, this is something that a lot of, uh, when, whenever you get into like higher levels of physics, you, you cannot make this assumption anymore. Uh, but we're going to make this assumption. Okay, the assumption is that the orbits are circles. And that's actually not the case. Okay, but we're going to make an assumption here that the orbit is moving in a perfect circle. Um, usually, that's not what ends up happening. Okay, the orbits don't make circular paths. Do what? They are normally, yeah, they are elliptical orbits. Okay, um, now, 
the the orbits that we get um, in terms of like uh, the the Earth and the Sun and stuff like that are really close to circles, but they actually do have a little bit of an oval to them uh, because there is a maximum distance away and there's a minimum distance away. Uh, maybe, yeah. We've sent, uh, we've sent, yeah, we've sent uh, objects to Mars. We've sent rovers and stuff like that, but we haven't sent people. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. So here we go. FC, we know that FC is equal to mv squared over r, right? Let's come up with some basic uh, terminologies here. This r, what does that actually stand for? Yeah, specifically for big bodies, this is going to be the orbital radius. Okay, so this is going to be the distance from the center of mass of one object to the center of mass of the other object. So if you have two objects that are, uh, uh, that are moving, the orbital radius, so let's say that you have an object like this and an object like this. The orbital radius goes from here all the way to here. Okay, if the objects are really far away from each other, the actual distance of their, um, the actual distance of the thickness of their planet doesn't make that big of a difference. However, if they are close to each other, you actually do need to include that value because if you do not include that value, obviously you would be like, you're, you're, you're adding error that wouldn't, that wouldn't work, okay? So keep in mind that whenever we're talking about radius here, that we're talking about from the center of mass to the center of mass. And if these things are really close to each other, these distances do matter. If these things are like 50 million bazillion miles apart, these distances don't, yeah, they don't matter nearly as much if they're that far away from each other. Okay, so that's that. The, the V squared is the orbital velocity. Orbital velocity. Little m is the satellite mass. Okay satellite mass. Okay, makes sense. Yep, go for it. Now, we know from Newton's laws that we have one force acting on this object, okay? That one force that's acting on this object, on this satellite, is what? So if I say FC, FC is actually going to be equal to, yeah, that's true. However, this is centripetal. So this is the equivalence of mass times acceleration. What force is actually acting here? Gravity. And we're not going to use mg this time. We're going to use this one instead. Okay, so the gravitational, the universal gravitational force the universal gravitational force is equal to our mass times acceleration, which since it's moving in a circle, is mv squared over r. And on this side, instead of putting fc, I'm going to put big G, little m, big M over r squared. And this is going to be our first important discovery about setting these things up with this expression. And that first really big discovery is that everybody close. Everybody brings mass to the party. Yeah, everybody brought mass to the party. So if everybody ended up bringing mass to the party, that means that the mass cancels out. So the satellite mass does not matter, okay, in these calculations. The satellite mass does not matter, okay? So if you're trying to find the velocity or the amount of time that it takes for them to move around this orbit, the satellite mass is completely and totally irrelevant. And whenever you guys see problems on this, you'll probably start freaking out because they'll, they'll give you like, well, this one's twice the mass of the other one. And the answer is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it was a bowling ball up there or the moon up there. Uh, it still would have the same orbital speed and radius to keep this orbit up going around the Earth. That's a tough one. That's a toughie. So if I cancel that out, 
um, I would just end up with big G, capital M, which is the mass of the central body over R squared. Sometimes that's a planet, sometimes that's a star. Um, and then that's equal to, on the other side, V squared over R. Okay? Now we learned something about V. In order to calculate what the velocity is, this thing's moving at a constant speed. So if I use distance over time, that's not really going to get us a whole lot of information. But I know that my distance is moving around in a circle. So instead of using distance as... It's not just the radius, though. It's not, it's not just the radius. Rainbow time. Look at that. Okay, this is a... <laughs> This is it. Oh, it's the circumference of a circle. Yeah. And the circumference of a circle is equal to what's the 2 pi r. Yeah. So for the velocity, it's going to be equal to 2 pi r over t. So I'm going to change this around. So v squared over r is really 4 pi squared r squared. Okay. Because, because 2 pi r squared is going to be 2 squared pi squared r squared over r so this is definitely going to be like a thanks i hate it moment yeah so then you got g big m over r squared equals four pi squared r squared it does not it does not cancel out because one of them's on bottom and one of them's on top. So R squared does not cancel out. In fact, R squared should not cancel out if you want it to be dimensionally consistent. R squared should not cancel out in this case. Okay? R squared should not cancel out. According to the proper laws of algebra, um, what should I do to try to get rid of this? I feel like I left something out. I did. I did leave something out. Something is something is wrong here. Before I move on, something is very wrong. No, no, no. I don't need to check the book of evil. I know what's wrong. I just need y'all to tell me what's wrong. Down here. So I can cancel one of these out? Okay. I can, and I will, and I appreciate that. But I have made an error. At this point, something is very wrong because I have substituted in velocity as 4 pi squared r squared. I totally forgot the t. Yeah, I totally forgot the t. So we're going to have to square the t as well too, right? So that t squared goes down here. Oopsie. OK. So now that I actually have the t squared, oh, and by the way, um, whenever we deal with big planet stuff, instead of using little t, we normally end up using big T. It does not matter either way. It's just that you're probably going to see me write it as big T for the period that goes around in a circle, or ellipse for that matter. Um, but you're probably going to see me write that instead. If you use little t, it's fine. It's not a big deal. OK, now we can do some cancellations. So. Um, what do we have here? You also said the r's can cancel, right? One r squared bloop, and one r bloop, can go away. Um, so we've got g big M over r squared is equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, we can do more. There's more that we can do. Because I see an R on the left side, and I see an R on the right side. Big M is the mass of the central body. So if, if this was the Earth and the moon, yeah, it's the mass of... If it was the Earth and the moon, it would be the mass of the Earth. If it was the sun and the Earth, it would be the mass of the sun. Okay? Now... Let's fix these. Bloop. Bloop.
If I, okay, well, first of all, yeah, we're going to cross multiply. So if we cross multiply, that means we're multiplying these together. It's R cubed. Yeah. R cubed. <laughs> what? 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 So that's G M is equal to four pi squared R cubed over T squared. Isn't this fun? Now, there's a couple of different things that we could do from this position. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move this 4 pi squared, and I'm going to move it over to the bottom over here. And I'll show you why I'm going to do that, because this is where things get really fancy. So this is going to be r cubed over t squared. And then on the other side, we're going to have g m over 4 pi squared. Now, what I have done, and the reason why I did this, is for a very specific reason. Okay, Everything over on this side is technically really kind of considered a constant value. Okay, Like, for example, the, if it's the mass of the Earth, the mass of the Earth isn't really going to change. You're not going to go over here and be like, all right, guys, tomorrow we're cutting the mass of the Earth in half. So from this point, yeah, yeah, from this point, we're just launching this straight into space and we're done. Okay, so like if you're talking about two planetary bodies, which radius would be used? The radius that we're given here is literally the distance between the two of them. Okay, so R, even though it says R, is actually a distance between the two. And the reason why it's the distance between the two is because this object is actually going in a circle around them. And that is probably a little bit confusing because... This object has a radius, this object has a radius, and this circular motion also has a radius. The radius that we're talking about here is the radius of the actual motion that's occurring. Okay, so if we have two celestial bodies, the radius that we're using is the distance between the two objects from center of mass to center of mass. Okay, that's the one that we're using. Um, and that value can change a little bit, okay? Um, G, the universal gravitational constant, is not going to change. That number is the same thing no matter what. And there's a fascinating story behind the person who came up with um, the, the constant or the, the, the most accurate version of the constant for big G that we m use in modern day situations. It doesn't, but our sun does orbit in the center of around the center of a galaxy. So I guess it would, uh, yeah, at the current hypothesis is that there's a supermassive black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. So if you consider a black hole to be a star, then technically our uh, sun would rotate around a bigger star. But a lot of people don't consider a black hole to actually be a star because it doesn't emit light. It sucks in light because it's too big. Uh, it's weird. Terrible things happen at that point. It hurts my head. Okay. So G is constant. M is constant. Pi is constant. Okay. 3.14159 does not change. Okay. You can't be like, all right, today, guys, we're going to make pi 5. Uh, and the number 4, yeah, the, the number 4 is constant. Okay. You do not need to argue with me and be like, all right, guys, so instead of four, we're going to use it as like seven today. No, all these numbers on the left side, these are constant values, okay? So what that means is that the ratio of the, uh, of the orbital radius to the orbital period is constant. It's always the same value, okay? That's big. That's really big, okay? So orbital radius, okay, orbital radius to orbital period is constant. Doesn't change. You always get the same thing, okay? And 
this is the kind of stuff that Johann Kepler came up with a long time ago. So we get to talk about we get to we get to talk about Johann Kepler and all of his three laws of planetary motion. Uh, we will not talk about Tesla. And the reason why is because Tesla does a lot of electromagnetic stuff, right? So we don't do that in AP Physics 1. That's more of an AP Physics 2 kind of thing. So in AP Physics 2, that's when we deal with that. I never get enough people to take AP Physics 2. So uh, that won't, yeah, that won't happen. Do what? It's always offered and people don't sign up for it. So do what? Yeah, that won't happen next year. Yeah, it's true, but that won't happen next year, because that that's kind of a they they allowed that because it was year one, year two, year three, and this will be the this will be the only year that it's going to be that small. I promise you. All right, so um, this constant over here, uh, technically this is called a Keplerian constant. Okay, uh, so if you want to ever use the word Keplerian. Uh, that is the constant value for the for the radius, uh, the orbital radius to the orbital period, and this number really like doesn't ever change at all, which is kind of weird whenever it comes down to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you know that that is related to the open response question, if you know, if you get an AP physics open response question and you know that, that Kepler's law or, or this, this, uh, this is Newton. Like we haven't even gotten into Kepler yet. All of this stuff that we just did was completely from Newton's laws, which was that force is equal to MA and that the circular acceleration is V squared over R. We took that and we changed it into, okay, well, that's the circumference of a circle. And then we just manipulated Newton's universal laws of gravitation with his laws that he already came up with. This isn't even Kepler yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you know, like, like we know that the orbital radius to the orbital period is always going to be constant for any central body. And in, in I've seen situations where um, they've given us uh, two things that are going around in an orbit, one of them with a large mass, one of them with a smaller mass, and they would say, which one goes faster? And the answer is, they go the same. And the reason why they went the same was because the orbital radius to the orbital period is is constant. There's no mass variation here, so you could totally use that as an argument, and you would you, you would get a lot of points for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, and that's that's definitely something that you can be used on the AP Physics exam, and is and is super useful. Okay. Um, let's see if I can try to find some stuff for us. Do what? What question? Oh, do you actually like that question was on a previous exam. Uh, I could probably find it in that back filing cabinet, but we can also probably find it on Google too. I was going to look more for some solar system stuff that we can do. What? Eventually I will, and it's almost time to start giving y'all some open response questions because um, we, we've actually gotten enough stuff in under our belts now that we can have some demon hybrid baby problems. That's, that's true. Uh, the, the recent quiz actually has something similar to that. So you'll be, you'll be a little bit happy with that one. Yeah, this one shouldn't actually take that much time to do. Well, let's see. Um, I'm going to try to run this. Still have a little bit more. There we go. All right. 
So here's a good example of a uh, object that's going around in circular motion. You can tell that it's like close to a circle, but it's not completely a circle. Um, but the deal is it doesn't matter what I change the mass of the purple orbiting body to be the size of that circle and the velocity that it takes to go around in that circle will stay the same. So if you see down in the bottom, it says like body one has a mass of 200 and body two has a mass of 10. Uh, if I change the mass on the bottom one, then it's going to do the exact same thing. So if I stop this and I change the mass to 10, if I can actually change it. Um, let's see, let's change it to uh, 5. Let's make it half as much. And whenever I go back in there, it does the exact same thing. Still goes around in the same circle. Yeah, uh, because there's not as much of a pull on it, right? Okay, now things, and this is what happens whenever you have something orbiting around a central object. The yellow uh, part in the middle, this is the mass that we're actually using to, um, this is the mass that we're using for the Keplerian constant. So everything that orbits around that central object is going to have this, constant that goes with it, this gm over 4 pi squared, that number is always going to be the same for anything that goes around, oops, 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 there it is, for anything that goes around on, on this object itself, okay? Uh, that, te that technically means that Earth's orbit is actually kind of squiggly, yeah, uh-huh. Absolutely. Um, I can switch this to sun, earth, moon, and it actually, the the sun, here we go, sun, planet, moon. So if you kind of look at it like this. So if you look at like, you, <laughs> you kind of have to think about it for a little bit of time, and it's like, wait, what? In in this case, the the purple is going to use the yellow object in the middle as the Keplerian constant, okay? But in the case of the little blue object that's going around, so like the little blue moon, the little blue moon, <laughs> the little blue moon is going to use the Keplerian constant of the purple mass, okay? So that would be gm over 4 pi squared, but the GM would be the mass of the planet, not the mass of the star, okay? Space is perfectly balanced as all things should be, is basically what you have. Um, everything that's already, like, if things were going to, like, collide with each other, they would have done so already. So, like, actual space collisions are, at this point in time, very rare, uh, because chances are everything's already done its boomy boomy moments and you don't really have anything left to go boomy boomy. Um, that being said though, collisions do happen and we actually get several objects that like fall to the earth and become uh, caught in the gravitational field and just get pulled in. So if you like look outside at night, you can usually see several different objects in the night sky that just fall. And, you know, they start off in space and they fall down. And usually they're just some kind of like dust or rocks or stuff. Uh, but the friction gets so hot that the rocks like catch on fire. And you guys know them as shooting stars. So whenever you see like a giant falling rock from the sky, y'all are like, yay, make a wish. And it's like, okay, well, that, that rock is on fire, literally on fire. That rock has been evaporated. Um, I don't think you can actually do four bodies here. Uh, unless, the only way that you could do that, yeah, so there are definitely several different setups for this kind of motion. That would be a planet in a binary star system, which does kind of weird stuff. Um, there are systems that are set up out in space that are binary stars, and let's see if we've actually got a binary example. If I can find it, my potato is not enjoying this very much at all. 
Uh, a double double is where you have two binary stars rotating around each other, like that. That would be a double double. Yeah, the actual like um, that would be complicated. Definitely be very complicated. Yeah, and that is something that we definitely need to talk about with like the the smaller and the bigger how they get closer to each other and then they kind of move away. That's something that we need to talk about as well too. And we've got a little bit of time left, so we can go ahead and talk about those. Um, since we actually said that these are Kaplarian constants and we're gonna have to like, we're gonna have to do a lot of practice questions with these in order to get comfortable with like velocities and, and stuff like that. So um, after we kind of go through these basics, we're gonna go through a lot of practice questions with these. I don't expect you guys to know rocket science just instantly off the top of your head. Um, but let's talk about Kepler's three laws. Okay, because these are pretty easy. Um, and honestly, we've just talked about one of them. Um, so Kepler's law number one, Johann Kepler said that all orbits are ellipses. So all orbits are elliptical. So whenever you look at an object that's moving around, instead of it being in a circle, it's actually going to be a little bit more like an oval like this. Okay, And the object that has the mass, the large mass that it's orbiting around, is going to be at one of the two focal points of that, uh, of that ellipse. Okay, So the orbiting masses or sorry, I was going to say, not orbiting mass, it's the uh, center mass. So the central mass, oh no, it's not going to, it's not going to erase anymore. Uh, okay, so, oh, there it goes. My poor potato. Central mass is at a focal point or a foci of the ellipse. Okay. Now, what I mean by a foci is that everything that's an oval has two focal points, and your orbiting body, or sorry, I keep saying that, your central mass has to be at one of those two places. The interesting thing is, if you're at either one of those two places, it actually creates the same orbital path. So it doesn't matter where, which spot it's in, it just has to be in one of those two positions. Okay. Um, number two, okay. Uh, orbital bodies, so satellites, so let's call them orbital satellites, cover equal areas in equal time. So what that means for us is that as something, let's just go ahead and get rid of one of these focal points. Let's just say that this one's gone. And I'm going to say, okay, so you've got an object that is kind of going around this really big object over here. Okay. When, it, when it's far away, it's going to be moving really slowly. When it gets closer to the actual orbiting object, it's going to be moving much, much faster than when it was way out here. However... If you look at the area that gets covered inside the ellipse, the two areas that get covered over the same amount of time, like this versus, and let's just say that we plotted this over a couple of days as well, and then it's going to go from like here to here. These two areas inside the ellipse are going to be equal to each other. So things that orbit around inside of an elliptical orbit cover equal areas in equal time. This is always true with anything that actually orbits around another object. Okay, orbital satellites cover equal areas in equal time. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, the third one is actually the one that we've already talked about and the one that you'll probably hate the most. Uh, that is the time of an orbit squared 
is proportional to the orbital radius. Oops, radius cubed. That's the third law. Okay, the time of an orbit squared is proportional to the orbital radius cubed. And what that means for us is that we can use Kepler's third law for an absolute crap ton of stuff because there is one thing that we know really well about one particular blue dot in our solar system, okay, called the Earth. And that's because, like, if you think about it, and this, this proportion is, like, is the same no matter what. So if you've got the Earth going around like this, we've actually got a t squared over r cubed set up already. So like, what is the orbital period of the Earth? How do we know that it's 365 days? Very good. Okay, so like, so like in this case, this orbital period up here would be 365 days. Here's what you're not gonna like about this, this time, needs to be in seconds. <laughs> so, I mean, because think about it. This is the KMS system, right? So if you've got 365 days, that's going to have to be 365 days in seconds. 31 million what? 536,000 seconds. Oops. That's close enough, right? 31,536,000. Yeah, I can't erase anymore, so I'm just gonna make that a big zero. There we go. Uh, because I played that that uh, orbital simulation, and my potato computer has decided that it has had it with me, so that's it. How do we know how far we are from the Earth or from the Sun? How do we know this? How do we know this distance? Yeah, we are about eight light minutes ish. But how do we know that distance? We did. Indirectly, but we did indirectly measure it, yeah. We can actually get pretty close. 17 million miles. One astronomical unit, one AU is the distance from the, the sun to the earth. Yeah, we call that one AU. And one AU is how many, uh, one AU is how many meters? It's 10 to the 11th meters. Okay, these two numbers are going to be really important to us when we start doing practice problems. So make sure that you have them. That was supposed to be red. <laughs> My poor computer. I can't even erase anymore. Oh, crap. Okay, so none of this works anymore. So keep this number in mind. Oh, that, now it's red. Okay, and then keep this number also in mind because we're going to need both of these. The interesting thing about it is when you find that t squared over r cubed, that t squared over r cubed is equal to the Kaplarian constant, which means if we wanted to find the t squared over r cubed of any planet or anything that's going around the sun in the solar system, all we need to do is use this ratio of t squared to over r cubed, and we can find it. Okay? So Kepler's third law is what we use to find times and distances of different planets and different orbital satellites around the earth because there's a lot of different things that orbit around the sun and the earth um, and we can use all of these things in order to find um, how long it takes them to go around without having to you know count the years in order for it to happen because a year for the earth is uh, or one revolution for the earth is 365 days that's pretty much considered a long time to us. You get several of those rotations around the Earth, and you've had a good life. Um, it takes Pluto 225 years to go around the sun. So in your lifetime, if you were trying to count one revolution, you would never count it for Pluto. It wouldn't happen. Okay, It takes a really long time for it to happen. You don't quote me on the exact 225 years part, but it's a long time. Um, okay. Questions, comments, concerns, donations? I can I can slow down. 
my computer is doing the uh the spinny wheel of death anyway so it's like you've you've done this too much too much you've had too much today I'm going to use the word exploit. We can uh we can exploit the Kaplarian constant in this fashion. So like the actual number for the Kaplarian constant sometimes is useful, but sometimes we can just skip it completely. So like if I were to look at the sun and I were to have two different planets. Let's call this like planet A and then I had planet B and they were going around the sun at different radii like this. A little hard to actually draw out a big solar system like that. But say that you've got two different planets, planet A and planet B. Well, if you were to actually find the Kaplarian constant between A and the sun, it actually turns out to be the exact same thing. So I'm gonna call this like KS, the Kaplarian of the sun. So the Kaplarian of the sun would just be like big G times the big mass of the sun over four pi squared, right? Well, well, that's the Kaplarian constant between A and the sun. What's the Kaplarian constant between B and the sun? The exact same thing. So here's what we can do. Since this is the same thing for both, I can say that T squared of A over r cubed of a is going to be the exact same thing as hang on i might actually have this upside down in newton's law it's r cubed on top yeah sorry let me fix that i'm going to reverse it yeah and you know what even if it is flipped over it's not that big a deal i'm just trying to keep with newton's so like r cubed of a over t squared of a is equal to uh, r cubed of b over t squared of b. Yeah, and if these are both flipped over, if both fractions are flipped over, the math works out exactly the same anyway. So if you call it r cubed over t squared or t squared over r cubed, it's the same ratio just flipped, okay? Um, so we can actually use this. If we have three of those pieces of information, we can find the fourth one. Um, and if we use Earth as a reference point, we already automatically have two of them. We have the radius of the Earth, uh, the, sorry, the orbital radius of the Earth, and we have the period of the Earth because we need, yeah, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So we can use Kepler's law, Kepler's third law, to find the distance between other places as well, too. Okay, notes are definitely handy. Um, but I think we're going to stop it there because I think we're almost out of time and we'll move on. We'll do some practice problems tomorrow, I believe.